I'm Richard Sabin. I'm a principal curator in the Mammals Group at the Natural History Museum, and I'm the curator of marine mammals. I develop the museum's uh, marine mammal research collection, and we produce data that we get out to the public through our galleries and through our comms. I'm standing in front of probably the gift that keeps giving. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's an earplug, a waxy earplug from a, a fin whale and it dates back to the 1950s. We've discovered in the past half century, in fact, that these things are incredibly valuable to science in so many different ways. The wax, after 140 years of being in a jar of formalin or alcohol, is, is pretty tough. It becomes quite brittle, so you have to be careful how you handle it, but it holds together fairly well. One of the things that we realized was that the preservative fluids that museums have used over the years don't actually affect what's inside the plug, so that's good for us. We're not losing any information. One of the things that we have seen through the study of these plugs is that uh, quite a large number of the uh, inorganic chemical pollutants that were banned in the 1960s and 70s are still out there cycling through marine ecosystems and, and being taken up by these um, top predators, by these marine mammals, cetaceans. One of the things that we have seen an increase in since the end of commercial whaling in the 1970s, 1980s, when you would think that stress levels in large whales would decrease, is a gentle, steady sort of increase. And we suspect that that's partly down to the fact that there are far more what we call sublethal stresses in the ocean environment these days compared to say 100 years ago. Things particularly like oceanic noise, the noise that we humans produce when we're drilling and dredging and all of the shipping that's going on. And, and that's something that affects whales and dolphins in the ocean because obviously they're using sound to communicate with each other and if they can't hear each other, it causes stress. Back in the 19th century, where it was fairly rare that they had access in a way which gave them the time to properly sort of examine the anatomy and collect things that were interesting. And one of the things that they collected were these plugs that they started to find in the, the ear canals. They weren't really recognized for both how they form and, and what they do for the animal, if anything. And it wasn't until the 1950s that a predecessor of mine at the museum developed a technique whereby sectioning the plug and looking at the layers of material, counting those layers, roughly equated to the age of the animal. So that was the first time that we had a sense that these things could be valuable to science. Biologists started to realize that the layers of material within these earplugs actually grabbed information about the health of the animal and also the environment, the ocean environment that the animal was living in. And it gave them a way to look back in time effectively that allowed us to create a time series of overlapping slices of whale earplugs from 20 different whales from 1870 through to 2016. It allowed us to look at changes to background levels of stress and whether there were peaks in those levels of stress and whether or not they corresponded with activities, human activities in the oceans. And of course they did. Since the stress study that we did, we've looked at things like the levels of pollution and how they have changed in the ocean over time. So who knows how valuable these things are going to be in future. It's because they form in the ear canals of, of large filter feeding whales like blue whales, fin whales, humpback whales. They have no external opening to their ear canals. So all of the, the wax that they produce, just like us, has nowhere to go. But it builds up in layers that we can read both in terms of the age of the animal. But more recently, we've been looking at what's inside each of those layers that forms year by year. And it's incredible the amount of material that gets secreted into those plugs from the animal's body, both the naturally occurring hormones like the stress hormone cortisol, the marine pollutants that get taken up into the, the things that the whales eat, so the fish and the krill, they actually find their way through the tissues of the animal's body and into its earwax. And everything is preserved in that kind of lipid rich plug. So, who knew that they would be so valuable? One of the things that we're fortunate to have access to in the UK is the Whale and Dolphin Strandings programme that allows scientists to have access to um, the unfortunately deceased bodies of whales and dolphins. But it gives us an opportunity to do the kinds of examinations that obviously we, we can't do on a live animal. The whale earplugs cannot be removed from a whale in life. It's something that has to be done after death. I think it's, it's an opportunistic thing. It's something that scientists around the world will continue to collect these plugs. Now we know how useful they are and just take the opportunity when it arises. This is a model of one of the earplugs in the collection. And there are several characteristics that you can see actually fairly clearly with this plug. The tapered end is the portion of the plug that forms in the animal when they're actually developing as a fetus. And then this line that you can see here, the distinction between the, the paler area and then the darker part of the plug, that's what we call the neonatal line. So this is when the animal's actually born. But then after maybe a year to two years, 
you can see that these more distinct lines, clearer bands start to form. That's when the animal starts to move on its annual migration to the feeding grounds, backwards and forwards. And that's when we can start to read exactly what's going on in the animal's life. They are remarkably useful things. And I think that people find them so interesting, particularly younger people, children, because they, it's earwax. It's like it's a comedy material. And who knew that there'd be so much science in there? Some of these earplugs can actually reach around about half a meter in length. If you imagine the size of a, of a blue whale skull, half a meter is quite a size. Blue whales on average live between sort of 70 and 80 years, so a similar kind of lifespan to us. And the opportunity to be able to look back over the course of an entire lifespan for a, a whale like a blue whale gives us a, an insight into things that you can't do through field observation. The plug that we have in the exhibition is actually from a fin whale that was um, collected back in 1955. And we estimated by counting the layers of material within each plug, it lived for about 40 years. Natural history collections like the one at the Natural History Museum provide an opportunity for researchers to come to us with their research questions. And the likelihood is if you're a researcher with an idea, with a question, we can help you answer that question with the material that we have. Since we published back in 2018 that first result for the, uh, the stress levels, it's just been getting bigger and bigger, more and more interest. I think it's because it's such a novel material. It's kind of almost like a comedy material in a way. People are fascinated that you can learn so much from earwax effectively, but I felt that it, it would show people that, that they have an effect on the world around them. They have an effect on these huge creatures that live in the deep ocean, and that it's not just an effect that's happening now, it's something that's steadily been building over the past century. Coming to a, a, a conclusion, hopefully, with us changing the way that we behave on land, and it's, it's that combination of scientists, and activists and, and you know, great motivational speakers that we have who've contributed to everything in this gallery to help give people a steer effectively. We're just trying to empower people to become advocates for the planet.